Um, the uh, singer-songwriter uh, Randy Newman uh, has a, uh, a song, uh, it's called Louisiana 1927, and it's about the great Mississippi flood uh, of 27, and, and uh, I'm not going to sing the, uh, the lyrics for you, I'll save you that pain uh, this afternoon. Uh, but uh, a line in it goes uh, in the main course throughout is Louisiana, Louisiana, they're trying to wash us away. Um, and, and that sort of to me is, is representative of what many people down in my home state are, are feeling today. Uh, I, I consider myself a New Orleanian. Uh, I went to college there and I, my adult life was spent there and I, I taught there for a few years. Uh, and today New Orleans is, is trying to recover, it's trying to come back, uh, but we still have a lot of challenges. Uh, half of the city's hospitals uh, remain closed. Uh, the school system is, is uh, coming back in some positive ways, but in many others, many students uh, are unable to connect where they were before, either because of transportation issues or no sustainable housing or uh, inadequate ways to, to uh, even enroll them in an actual school. Crime rates are up. Uh, the murders have been committed even by my, one of my past students, uh, committed a quadruple uh, homicide back in uh, 2006. And, and so stories like this go on and on, and, and we see that there's lots of problems in New Orleans. But it, it's not like the, uh, the flood that, that came through uh, back in 2005 was the flood that uh, caused any of this. You know, the problems in New Orleans it, were just highlighted because of media coverage after Katrina. A lot of the problems we see were uh, going on in many cities across the country and continue to today. Uh, we look, for example, uh, at old industrial cities, uh, the Clevelands, Detroits, that are uh, starting to crumble, and, and these cities are having a hard time uh, collaborating and working with the inner city versus the suburbs, so that's a tension. You've got gateway cities like the Miamis and the Baltimores that struggle with immigration issues and how to connect new peoples into society and go forward and prosper. And then you have cities uh, where I come from in the South that still struggle with a legacy of racial segregation and, and don't quite know how to fit things in. Uh, so to many people, uh, whether white or black, rich or poor, uh, down in New Orleans, they, they feel like people are trying to wash them away. Uh, one issue that, that's close to my heart uh, is that of education. Um, you know, prior to the storm, uh, I joined Teach for America uh, because I saw two different worlds of education in New Orleans. And I, and I think this is probably the way it is in a lot of communities across the country. But there was one for the rich, who tended usually to be white, and that was the, the private schools, the parochial schools. Uh, and the other system tended to be all black and tended to be for those who were poor. Uh, and that was the public schools. And to me, that just wasn't acceptable. I just couldn't stand that. And then I started to read more of the facts of, of education in this country. Uh, for example, the 30 million word gap, you know, on average low income uh, children from low income families uh, compared to the higher income families by the age of three have a gap of 30 million words that they haven't heard. And that's something they never make up. You know, additionally, nine year olds in this country in low income versus their higher income uh, comparative groups, uh, they're on average three years behind the higher educated groups. Uh, only half of them end up graduating high school. Those that do, only a quarter actually uh, can read above an eighth grade level. And then of all that, only 10% end up graduating college. You know, this, this is the struggles that many people feel in our urban cities, uh, in, in our cities in general across America. And it's, it's this feeling that somebody's trying to wash them away. But, you know, I don't, I don't see necessarily the same pessimism that a lot of people maybe saw earlier this morning. I see a lot of hope. Uh, and, and the hope is, is clearly evident by uh, my other three colleagues, and I know Shannon will do the same and sort of inspire you about what we're willing to give and, and the hope that we see in these communities. In New Orleans, for example, in education, um, more than half of all the schools now that are reopened are all charter schools. You know, we have uh, between 48, and there may have been another that was just added recently, maybe 49, schools that are operated by young entrepreneurs who decided we're going to try education a different way. You know, government has a role to play, but maybe there's a different solution. Maybe there's a different way to partner, for example. Uh, with these schools. And that's something that we're seeing now and we're seeing that being successful. I think what the real message is to the next president, besides sort of pay attention to these issues in the communities, you know, whether you're uh, a John McCain and maybe you get the stereotypes that you don't care about uh, minority communities and you don't understand the issues there. Or maybe you're a Barack Obama and they say, or a Hillary Clinton and say, you can't connect with the suburbs. You can't, you know, connect with the wealthier voters or those that happen to be Republican. And it, it, we've got to get past it. You've got to understand how to bridge this gap, that, that the issues of all of us are going to affect one another of us. Uh, every one of us has these problems to face, whether it be with crime or higher taxes. The problems of the inner cities are going to be the problems of the suburbs and vice versa. So how do we solve this? And I think the way the, the president really does this is through this new partnership, through this idea of a, maybe a redefinition of what citizen means. 
you know, Harry Truman, when he left office, uh, was asked, well, you know, how does it feel to, to leave the highest office in the country? And, and Truman responded, you know, I'm not leaving the highest office. You know, I'm gaining the highest office. I'm entering the highest office, and that's a citizen. And that word, you know, there, there's a hunger here on this stage. There's a hunger out in the audience today. There's a hunger in this country for a redefinition of citizenship. We're already laying the groundwork. We're already starting our own businesses that partner with the government to provide these social services. We're already volunteering our time in Teach for America to teach uh, students in urban cities and in rural communities. We're already volunteering our time to go to foreign countries and provide the aid relief to tsunamis and cyclones and, and things like that. We're already doing that on the battlefield in Iraq. But we need an even bigger national call to your generation and to our generation for that. Uh, one of my students after the hurricane, I, I lost my first school and had to move to a neighboring town uh, in Laplace, Louisiana. It's really just this one road and, and you know, everything sort of connected there. So I'd see my students at the grocery store and things like this. And we took on 700 evacuee students at the school after the storm. And literally all they had for me was a double wide trailer, no desk, no chairs, no books. I didn't have a chalkboard. I had to go to a Home Depot and buy a shower board and sort of nail it to the wall just to have supplies. And, and, and what I came to realize is, is the outpouring of support from church groups, from people across the community, uh, community uh, around the nation who would send us supplies that helped us get along. And, and one uh, thing that happened early on in those days was there was one of my favorite students was a girl named Kara who I uh, just recently found out was accepted to Xavier University in New Orleans where she's going to study pre-med. Uh, which is, is a fantastic news. She was transplanted to Laplace. Uh, her mother wasn't able to come. Her mother actually went for a job in Houston. She lived with an aunt uh, in Laplace. And, and Kara asked me probably about two or three weeks into my new teaching tenure there, you know, Mr. Meyer, why, why have they abandoned us? Why, why has the president, why has the state, why, why have people abandoned us? And, you know, so as I typically did as a teacher, as many of my professors do here, is I flipped it back on, on the class. Well, why do you think that? You know, why do you think they've abandoned us? Why, why do you get the feeling, have they abandoned us? And who's abandoned us? And why do you think that? And so I got a lot of comments. Maybe they're racist. Maybe they don't fully understand the problem. Uh, maybe they did it intentionally to hurt us. But I waited because I could see Kara was, was contemplating this idea. Kara, it, you know, her, her mind was, was tinkering with this. And, and I came back to her and she said, you know, I, I don't think it's that they, they don't want to help. I think they just don't know how. You know, and, and, and I hope Kara's right. And, and I think Kara's right. I mean, from what I hear on the stage and what I've heard today is, is, is Kara is absolutely right. Maybe, maybe we want it. Maybe we have the will. We maybe just don't know how. So this next president, most importantly, he or she, they can redefine this word citizen. And they can, they can show us the way to partner in a new way of government, private, public sector relationships, a new way to make a difference so that people don't feel like they're trying to wash us away. Thank you.